Lost Ark is an ARPG MMO, meaning it's your typical top-down action role-playing game. However, it's also massively multiplayer. Originally released in South Korea in 2019 by Smilegate, they partnered up with Amazon Game Studio and offered a Western release in the year 2022. Within just 24 hours of release, Lost Ark at the time became the second most played game on Steam. Boasting a fast-paced and dynamic combat system, a really unique class system offering many different things from different builds and playstyles that allows for quite a variety of ways to engage with the content. I personally enjoyed this game during its release, but I only played for about a week or two. And to be honest, besides some faint memories of a pretty good combat system, and a distinct memory of it being riddled with dailies and a pay-to-win monetization strategy that's pretty common to see in the Asian gaming market, I don't really remember much else. Fans of Lost Ark will tell you that the game is single-handedly one of the best ARPG experiences that you can have at the moment, but they'll also warn you about the systems that are lurking behind that can feel like a daily rotation of chores and feature a lot of pay to convenience but also pay to win, that could have you feeling slightly behind if you don't participate. That being said, I'm excited to jump back into Lost Ark, starting fresh on a new character. I'm gonna play until I reach the max level of 50 and explore some of those systems that are baked into the game. I'm gonna find out just how invasive these systems really are and come to my own conclusion. Is this game worth your time? Should you try it out? Is it fun despite some of the systems, or do they bog the game down to a slow, tedious, boring snooze fest that just incentivizes you to pay to escape that nauseating monetization hell? Now, Lost Ark features six different archetypes which feed into your class selection. For example, the Warrior archetype features five different classes from a Gunlancer to a Paladin. However, another archetype, like the Specialist, has two class options to choose from the artist and the aromancer. The classes within Lost Ark are gender locked. This is usually done for a narrative or voice acting reasons, but I think it generally causes more headaches for players than not. I personally don't care what gender my character is as long as the gameplay and the class is fun to play. However, some people really like to be able to make the same type of character or play the same fantasy that they have in their mind. I highly suggest to any new players to actually read up on their class a bit, even with just the in-game information that's given to you, as this will dictate your playstyle for basically the rest of the game on your main character. And some of the classes can actually be significantly more difficult to play at the same level as others. One thing I'd also like to point out here is that this is by no means the complete end-all be-all of your customization, as your class is likely to change how it plays and use differing abilities later on just due to the build of your character which we'll get into more on that later. The character creation is a seamless process, and already visually, the game is massively impressive. I mean, you'll see as this video carries on, but the game is just beautiful. And not only that, I can play this game on the maximum graphical settings and almost experience no issues related to performance. That's on top of recording and doing other things on my PC as well, so really, it's just optimized quite nicely. I personally ended up choosing the Berserker class, the massive two-handed greatsword, and the way your character handles themselves, it really reminds reminded me of Orin from Final Fantasy X, and for that reason alone, I was hooked. Also, the game gives this class a difficulty rating of 2 stars out of 5. Listen, I can give you all a lot of opinions about video games, but I never claimed to be good at actually playing them, okay? After spending some time in an intergalactic fever dream of class creation, I was teleported into the world of Arcasia, and I found myself in a very unique place, somewhere you could never expect when creating a new character for an MMO. Such an original and cool... I'm on a boat. Yes, another game where I'm on a boat. When you're a new player, you have this tiny little seed next to your name that signifies that you are new to the game, I guess to communicate to other players that you might need help. There's actually a similar system in Final Fantasy XIV as well. Personally, I think it makes me look about 73% less badass, so I'm not a huge fan, but it's okay, we can roll with it. One of the first things that I noticed when taking a look around my user interface is the absolutely ridiculous amount of red dots. Due to the psychological addiction that you, me, and basically everybody has to their mobile phones because of the dopamine acquired when receiving and opening notifications, this messed with my zoomer brain. I had no idea how to clear all of the red dots as some of them were basically not things that I could click on or were things that would basically be redundant to click on as within a few seconds of gameplay you would probably receive another red dot. 
Now, this is actually a legitimate tactic that we see used excessively in the mobile gaming market to not only send you push notifications, but to also replicate that notification dopamine. It's there in order to make you feel like there's always something that you need to be doing. It was extremely annoying at first, but I got pretty used to it after playing for a little while. I started my character fresh on a new server, but it seemed that I had a couple of gifts left over from when I had played the game prior during its release. Nothing too crazy, a little bit of currency and a couple of chests filled with a random assortment of items, which I had no idea what they did. Besides all that, however, the UI is actually fairly clean and fairly easy to understand from a gameplay perspective. The minimap and the quest tracker are small, easy to read, and understandable. The same with your action bar and abilities. There is an absolutely absurd amount of different interfaces that you can access from your menus though. And even after playing 100 hours, I'm not entirely sure what every single interface is used for. I can say, however, especially for the intro to the game and your first long time playing, you're not really going to need to interact with all of these. So I would suggest just learning about them as you go and don't spend too much time in the beginning trying to understand every underlying system. Just go have fun. And that's exactly what I did. I just began following the story quest. Interestingly enough, this game actually starts you at level 10, not level 1. I don't know why this is, I can't really think of any logical reason, but I mean, okay, cool. I met up with a priest and we hacked and slashed our way through swaths of the enemy forces. Oh yeah, the combat is fucking amazing. I don't think I've played another game with combat that is quite as satisfying as Lost Ark. Granted, I'm not and do not claim to be an experienced top-down ARPG player, so I may be ignorant, but just comparing the combat here to other MMO experiences that I have, Lost Ark kinda has it figured out. Slamming my giant greatsword into a pack of 10 plus enemies at the start of the game really just had me hooked. I couldn't care less about anything else except just getting into the next fight, and there's really something to be said about a game that does combat right. Because too many times it turns into just another chore or thing that you have to do to continue progression. But if you can make combat into something that players are actually looking forward to participating in, well I think that's a recipe for success. Already, I was given access to a mount. This is something I think at some point games can just give you by default. Having a mount is such an essential part of the MMO experience, being able to travel across the game faster is almost always going to be welcomed by me and many players. So, I'm happy that Lost Ark gives you access to this so soon. I picked myself a black stallion and I was excited to continue on my journey. I took a quick look at the map to see if I remembered much about the time that I had played prior, and honestly the thing looked completely foreign to me. Not to mention, massive. <laughs> this game is pretty huge. Later on you'll find yourself literally sailing between continents. And that takes quite a sizable chunk of time to actually do. To be honest, I was already feeling like I could end up spending a lot of time playing this game. I found my first Mokoko seed. That is one out of 1,235 Mokoko seeds that you can find hidden throughout Arcasia, within dungeons, behind puzzles and locked areas, and that's just one of the few different massive collection systems that exist within Lost Ark. If you're a collector and you like completionist content, there's enough of that featured within this game to last you literally years. I always love to see this in games from OSRS's collection log to Guild Wars 2 and the completionist aspect of exploring every map, Lost Ark also does this very, very well. And even if you don't feel like hopping into super hardcore endgame content, there's always something for you to do in terms of achieving more on your character. A lot of these systems are also roster wide, which essentially means that when you make new characters or alts, they're assigned to a roster, where along with your main character or any other characters that you have, they'll receive benefits depending on your roster level. We'll get into alternate characters and how essential they are to Lost Ark later on, but for now, account wide sort of progression systems are always a positive in my books. I got to level 11 and achieved my first assignable skill points. These can completely change how a certain ability you have might operate, and it's super fun to play around with. You can respect these points basically whenever you want, so while I was leveling, I was always experimenting and trying out different versions of the same abilities. For example, at certain level thresholds of an ability, you'll have a few different options, as each ability basically has its own talent tree. Of course, these things tend to end up in a meta with the end game, but while leveling, I mean, just play around with it and see what you like. Also, Lost Ark does feature a fast travel system. As your character progresses throughout the game, you're going to learn different songs. Some of these songs act as a sort of hearthstone to take you back to a select location, or a song that teleports you to your player-owned area. 
There's songs that'll teleport you directly outside of a dungeon that you're currently inside. But the one that you're going to use the most involves these triports. Anytime you see one of these triports, make sure to activate it, as essentially it's a teleport location. And as long as you're within the same continent as that said active triport, you'll always be able to play the song of triport and teleport there. Now, every class has this unique class ability, which you'll find in the center of your action bar. That has to be completely filled with a resource, usually gained during combat. For example, for my Berserker, when this bar fills up, I can enter a burst mode that makes me glow all fiery red. It greatly increases my damage and crit chance and movement speed, and it even speeds up all of my cooldowns. I'm not sure what all the class abilities look like for all of the other classes in the game, but being in this burst mode as a Berserker is like the epitome of fun. Nothing stands a chance. Around level 13, I entered my first dungeon and participated in my first sort of boss fight. You'll see from his health bar up top that you can see his total HP displayed in numbers, however if you look to the right it says times 7. All that means is that he has 7 health bars full of health, but all of them together is still just 6,945 HP. I don't know. It was a little confusing to me at the start. I think this is a typical thing to see in other Asian RPGs, but obviously it's a little different to what we're used to here in the West. Now, one of those items that I had actually received in my mailbox earlier on presented a three-day crystalline aura pass. I decided to use it, which might have been a complete waste, because while playing the game, I didn't really notice a tangible difference between having this aura active or not. The only thing that I really noticed is that while I had the aura active, my triport teleports were free. But the cost for using those teleports is literally so negligible that they are essentially free anyway. But the Crystalline Aura is basically Lost Ark's version of a subscription. And after looking into it a bit more, it essentially gives you a cost reduction in a ton of different in-game activities. It also speeds up many of the time-gated things that you're going to access later on. Bear in mind, this game is chock full of systems which feature daily energy limits and restore rates and 12-hour idle timers. Like I said prior, this sort of monetization is extremely common, especially in the Asian gaming market, so it's very much so to be expected within Lost Ark. But the point that I'm trying to find out with this video is, where is the bottleneck? At this point in the game, the Crystalline Aura basically provides me no benefit. But when does it start to benefit you? When does it become borderline necessary to purchase the subscription to continue? If ever. Now, the questing experience while leveling is really quite nice. It's pretty much mindless. You go to a new area, you pick up your story quest to continue with the main storyline, but there'll generally be between one or three side quests that are also available. During my time leveling, I picked up every side quest because they're literally always in the exact same area as your story quest. You hardly have to look at your minimap or really even think of where to go next. It's very objective oriented. Do this, kill that, pick up that, search this. It honestly feels like you're basically just power leveling. I ran through a few more dungeons. Interestingly enough, you always get these options to do the dungeon on normal or hard mode. I always picked hard and I found them to be pretty trivial anyway. You also get the option to join a sort of match finder and find a group for a dungeon. But I tried this a couple of times and I think these dungeons are just not very active anymore as no one seemed to join my groups. That's hardly an issue though because up to this point they were all extremely soloable. Within just a couple of hours of gameplay my character was already level 20. I had acquired a ton of new gear and weapons and jewelry which all has its own item level which will form your character's item level. It's my understanding that item level is kind of the true level in this game, as once you're level 50, like everyone else, the real way to tell how strong a character might be is going to be through their item level. I took a short break now to play some World of Warcraft with a girlfriend, and when I came back, I couldn't help but notice that my character looked completely badass. Already. To be honest, as more of an old school MMO player, I would prefer my character to really look badass when I feel like I've earned a lot of that gear or armor. If you already look badass at level 20, with like two and a half hours of gameplay, then that means that looking badass is devalued. Because basically everybody is going to look badass, and looking badass is badass, okay? A bit more leveling later, and I was introduced to the trade skill system. First, it showed me mining. There are ores riddled throughout the world, and you can gather those ores, which you can use as a resource, later on to craft other items and to further progress with your player-owned area. We'll get into that system later on, but on top of mining, there's also fishing, logging, hunting, excavating, and foraging, all of which can be leveled up. 
You're given a certain amount of gathering energy that you can use every day, which refreshes at a rate of something like 30 per 10 minutes. So you could theoretically run out of energy and not be able to gather any further that day. However, for me personally, I never actually used all of this energy, but I haven't really tried to dedicate a full day to using my gathering skills. Speaking of gathering skills, however, I had heard of this horrible, awful problem within Lost Ark. Just rumors so far as I had seen no evidence firsthand, that is, until now. When about 400 people with weird gibberish names and all wearing the same thing with the same pet were fishing at this dock. Guys, I don't think there's much fish left in there. I mean, imagine trying this in real life. I don't think you'd get any bites at a certain point. But yes, these are bots, and I've heard before that Lost Ark has a major botting issue. Though, this was my first time seeing it firsthand. I think it's pretty safe to assume that this probably has some negative consequences for the economy, especially for trade skill items like this. But any further negative effects from the botting are still unknown to me. Besides the fact that just seeing an army of players like this might be confusing to someone who doesn't understand that they're bots. Maybe some of you longtime players in the comments can let me know your opinion on the botting situation in Lost Ark. The next day I logged in and just logging in gave me 1 million silver. I'm not sure why, but we take those. Lost Ark is a game of many, many rewards. Login rewards, playtime rewards. You are constantly clicking claim this or claim that. It can be a little overwhelming, especially to a new player, but I mean, I'll take it, I guess. I was also beginning to receive these cards. They vary in rarity, and I thought they were just a part of another collection system, and in a way, they are. But they can also provide buffs to your character. When you have a certain amount of cards from the same collection, you get a buff. This is just one of those many more interfaces and systems that I was talking about prior. For example, certain sets of cards will give you a reduction in lightning damage or fire damage. I figured I would probably delve into this system later on, but for now, just collected cards. You can get them from random rewards as well as from quest completions. One thing I would like to point out here is that some of the scenes that you enter into when you're completing dungeons or quests are just absolutely breathtaking. From ziplining from a horde of goblins or literally taking siege equipment along with a massive army to break into a castle and then jump slide down the gates into a 1 versus 100 battle. There is no shortage of these moments while playing and the more out of the world and unlikely and yes, badass that it made my character, the more fun I was having. The seamless situational transitions from these cool cutscenes to combat made a lot of dungeons and quests about 10 times more fun than you would really expect. They do such a great job with this. And this just adds to the fact that once again, it's one of the most graphically beautiful games that I've played in a while. At this point, I finally gained access to my player-owned stronghold. This is essentially an entire island that you now own because you helped siege said castle. Welcome, adventurer. Here, you will find that you can upgrade your stronghold, research new recipes, craft new things, completely customize the place with decor and items that you earn out in the world. And you have your own stronghold level that will increase with the more things you build, and you even have your own ship and crew that you can send out on missions. There's about 30 more systems just baked into the stronghold here, which I won't go fully in depth with all of them, but I actually had a great time managing my stronghold, just checking up on it whenever you log in or take a break from the game. It only takes a few minutes, and it gives you a good sense of idle progression, even when you're not playing the game. I got myself to level 30, and while exploring some other rewards, I managed to come across some cosmetics. Hell yes, I am now a snowman, and so is my pet. Tis the season. I don't know, my tongue's out, but I absolutely love this look. Oh, and also I got this new mount, which is like a snowboard, I guess. It kind of felt faster, even though it technically isn't. But yeah, that's what we're rolling with. Around level 32, I got into a crazy fight with a demon dragon trapped inside a tower. This was one of the coolest fights that I had participated in so far. Using the environment around as an ever-moving and escalating battlefield, it was pretty awesome. Within another few hours of gameplay, I had finally acquired level 40. And this is when I was actually finally introduced to the sailing system. At this point, I was pretty confused about how it worked. But essentially, there are eight different ships that you can unlock in the game and many different crew members that you can take with you. Currently, I only had one crew member and one ship, but depending on the types of water that you may need to go through, you might want to change your ship or your crew to accommodate that. You can also further customize these with different colors and symbols, and honestly, sailing is easily one of the best parts of the game. The vast size of the ocean within the game is actually mind-blowing. It can take you quite a long time to travel from one part of the map to the other. 
Not only are there different continents you can travel to, but also along the way there's different islands, each with their own quests and collections and puzzles and stories and things that you can do. There's even certain islands that will only appear at certain times or when certain actions are triggered throughout the world. It's absolutely hands down the best sailing I've seen in an MMO personally. It doesn't feel like a chore or feel tedious, it simply feels like a means to an end in terms of traveling. And on top of that, along the way there's just so many interesting things that you might find or discover. I think any game looking to add sailing to their repertoire in the future could definitely take a page out of Lost Ark's book. I'm looking at you, old school RuneScape. Anyways, I sailed to the island of Tortoik, where I was subsequently shrunk down to the size of an ant. Pretty cool. Does anyone remember Honey, I Shrunk the Kids? Same idea. And I mean, just look at the size of these giant co- Day 3. I was level 44, and I figured today would be the day that I finally get to level 50 and really begin to explore what the end game looks like in Lost Ark. So far, I had just been non-stop questing, grinding, doing dungeons, and it's been an absolutely wonderful leveling experience. It's quick and easy, and it feels good. I found a new continent where they had me participate in a tournament in order to prove myself and progress within the story. I even ran into my first world boss. That dude had a lot of health. Like, a lot. I don't think I could do that much damage if I spent three hours straight attacking him. I also ended up getting another ship and I was nearing ever closer to level 50. I traveled to a steampunk sort of desert area and I found myself in the city of Stern. Here I went into a dungeon where I was able to control a giant mech suit and just blow shit up. It was awesome. And finally, I got myself to level 50. And I was told that I unlocked Guardian Raids, Abyssal Dungeons, and Chaos Dungeons. I assumed that these were more of the endgame progression systems, but I still didn't quite understand how I was supposed to access these just yet. I also found out that I was completely wrong! 50 is not the max level. It's... it's 60. But, the experience between level 50 and 51, for example, is about a million times more experience than between 49 and 50. I learned that any of the levels post 50 is more considered to be a prestige level. And if you are 50, you're considered generally at the highest level, though you will still gain some skill points for every level up until 60. I finished up the story quests around the Stern area and I was directed towards Vern. This would be where I would really be able to delve into a lot of the post-max activities. Though as far as I could tell, I was nowhere near really being done with the main story quests either. I was a little unsure as to what I was supposed to actually be doing now that I was level 50. I didn't know what would be more beneficial. Sticking with the story perhaps, or just delving straight into other forms of progression. I noticed I had something called an Awakening Quest, which piqued my interest, and after running and sailing around a bit, I actually unlocked an Awakening skill. It's basically another ultimate ability. You can actually unlock different Awakening abilities later on, though I'm not quite sure how at this point. Now that I was max and I had my Awakening ability, I felt mostly ready to try and jump into some of these Chaos Dungeons, Guardian Raids, and the like to really feel out what at least a little bit of the endgame looks like. Essentially, Chaos Dungeons are an activity that you can participate in and benefit from twice every day. You face off against a horde of enemy monsters and depending on what tier you're currently working towards, will drop you armor and weapons. At least the starter armor and weapons for that particular tier and item level. You will also get jewelry from all of these which can come with random stats. Depending on which class you're playing and which build you chose, that's going to dictate which stats you want to prioritize. These chaos dungeons take a few minutes at most and they're pretty satisfying, as just the ridiculous amount of monsters that you are mowing down is amazing. I'm not sure if they get more difficult later on, but I'm almost certain they do. Afterwards, I went to try a guardian raid. First guardian, urinal. Or Erniel, I believe is how you pronounce the name. These you can do whenever you want, and you can do them solo or within a group. Though it's important to know that you can only claim a Guardian Soul once per day. So if you want the best rewards from doing this activity, it is once again restricted by a daily limit. But essentially, you're placed on a giant map, and the Guardian is located somewhere on that map. Some of these maps are actually quite big, and it can be difficult to locate the Guardian. Unless you use an item called a Flare, then you'll know its exact location. The Guardian actually has no health bar, which is a really interesting mechanic because you never know how close you are to being finished the fight. You always have to stay on your toes. Sometimes during the fight, the Guardian might move around. Each tier features a few different Guardians. Since I'm in the first tier, they're generally pretty easy. But once again, I'm certain these pick up in difficulty immensely 
later on. After playing around and having a lot of fun with these Chaos Dungeons and Guardian Raids, I was actually given a quest to go and talk to an NPC about upgrading my gear. This is where the real power and character progression loop begins to take place in Lost Ark, and it's done through a system called Honing. This will require a ton of resources to be able to upgrade all of your gear. Luckily, through leveling, you're actually given a massive amount of these resources. So the first little while while you're going through Tier 1 is an absolute breeze. Though your Tier 1 materials won't necessarily translate to Tier 2 and later on to Tier 3. One important thing to know about the honing system is you can actually use some of these resources and it is anything but a guarantee. There are certain bonus items you can use to increase your particular chance of successfully honing into the next level. And at my current state, I generally have a greater than 70% chance of success. But I've heard that later on these percentages get worse and worse. So a little bit of RNG and resource usage that plays into the gearing up process of Lost Ark. It's not my favorite system by any means, and this is where you're going to see the majority of that bottleneck, which will really separate the paying version to the non-playing version of players. Afterwards, I was a little unsure of how to continue or what I should work on next. I wanted to continue working on my story quests, as honestly, traveling and questing and enjoying the vast world was slowly shaping up to be my favorite part of the game. However, I did have another activity that I could complete in town, and that was interacting with this tower system. Essentially, you can enter this tower, and there are 20 floors with 20 different rewards that vary in difficulty level. Once again, the game will notify you of the correct or recommended item level to go in with. I actually had a ton of fun in here. Some of the floors were simple and easy, some had cool boss fights, and some I simply had to survive. This werewolf was particularly difficult as he turned invisible somehow. For me, I don't know if that was a bug. And afterwards, I actually made it all the way to the 20th floor, where I got absolutely rocked. With all that said and done, I figured let's continue in this story and see if that will help me progress my gear further because I couldn't get more gear just yet as the reset hadn't happened and I couldn't interact with the higher level chaos dungeons or raids until I had finished certain parts of this quest storyline. So I made my way through icebergs using my new ship, the Sturm Breacher, which can break hard objects in front of it. There, I participated in a cool stealth mission and even got myself a new mount, this awesome frost wolf. Afterwards, I went to the zone of Rohendel, this was an exceptionally long boat trip, and you can't use any form of quick travel to get to areas of the map that you haven't been yet. I'm not kidding, this trip probably took me 15 minutes in total while avoiding certain dangerous parts of the ocean and just going through some of the non-avoidable parts. The final sort of dungeon in the Rohendel area had easily some of the coolest boss fights and interactions that I had ever partaken in, from solving chess puzzles to fighting on a constantly moving surface with dizzying camera angles. The immersion in some of these is literally a masterclass on how to do great boss fights. They were a ton of fun, and after finishing the Rohendel area, I unlocked yet another system. Did I say I was overwhelmed with systems yet? The skill transfer system, whereby adding these non-equipable pieces of jewelry, kind of confusing, that you might get from Chaos Dungeons or other places, you can actually upgrade your particular advancements that you can find under each of your skills. It's actually kind of cool and pretty simple. On to the next story quest in the next zone, we went to hang out with some dwarves in the southwestern corner of the map and into the area of Yorn. Once again, beautiful zone, beautiful cutscenes, beautiful boss fights, and it was while finishing Yorn that I finally got to what I can assume is the first bottleneck. In order to advance to the next area of the story quest, Phaeton, I was going to need to acquire an item level of 960, my current item level being 811 because I spent a bunch of time honing my gear. But apparently what I thought I needed to do is participate in the Chaos Dungeons unlocked by completing the Yorn area. I thought that completing those dungeons would actually give me gear which would be higher level than 960. But unfortunately, after taking a look at the Chaos Dungeon selection, I wouldn't actually be able to get any new gear as loot until Punica, which would get me to tier 3 and item level 1100. So I guess we're honing all the way to 960. I really hope I have enough resources saved up as this could take a bit. Luckily, I still had enough resources from leveling, though I was cutting it pretty close. And the honing chances were becoming slightly slimmer, sometimes taking two or three tries to finally get a piece of gear honed to the next level. Eventually, I got to item level 960, and the new area and quest immediately became available to me. Just a quick sail to the northwest laid Phaeton, 
Once again, questing through this area was a ton of fun, and I even started to see some higher level skilling nodes, which is something I was wondering about, as mostly it seemed like the world was just filled with copper ores and the same flower. But here I found iron ore, different mushrooms, bigger trees. It's interesting because in most MMOs, I feel like you start seeing the next tier of gathering nodes at a much sooner point than you do in Lost Ark. And here I actually got my first level post 50. Before what was taking potentially felt like 10 to 20 minutes per level, level 51 actually took me probably 5 to 10 hours of gameplay. I'm unsure of the exact estimate, but these post 50 levels felt great, and the skill points were highly appreciated. I made it to the main city, which has some pretty awesome verticality, before continuing to quest around here. Another fucking stealth mission. My god. Okay, it was close, but I made it. I feel like I keep saying this all the time, but Phaeton has like the best cutscenes I've seen so far. An epic battle with a demon that fell through a portal in the sky, where you have to use the surrounding environment to your advantage had me once again feeling like a complete badass. But... At this point, I feel like I was really starting to see the gameplay arc, if you will. Essentially, you grind out the item level required to continue the story quest, and then you complete said story quest, and once again, you return to doing Chaos Dungeons and Guardian Raids and other daily activities in order to gather resources so that you can push to the next item level to continue with the story. I think it's safe to assume that at some point you will reach the end of the story, and at that point you will be pushing your item level in order to access further Guardian Raids, Abyssal Raids, and Dungeons. Suffice to say, I finished up in Phaeton, and sure enough, in order to continue forward, I had to work towards the item level of 1100. At this point, I feel like I've played enough to give a fair estimation of my first impressions with Lost Ark, and what you can expect from this game in the year 2023 and the beginning of 2024. Essentially, here's what's going on. You have some of the best gameplay in terms of combat, visuals, collecting, exploring, world navigation, end game combat difficulty, like, it's the full and complete package. This game is, no joke, one of the most fun MMOs I've ever played. It's like a hack and slash dungeon crawler, except you have an entire world to crawl, and it's multiplayer. If you want to turn your brain off and just fight through hordes of bad dudes, or focus on leveling up your skills, or travel around collecting items, you're totally free to do so. But instead, if you would prefer to get a group of friends or perhaps just play solo and take on some exceptionally challenging content that's going to require you to really push yourself and learn the combat and learn your class, you can do that as well. This is easily one of the best free experiences that I've had so far on this channel in terms of the first 75 to 100 hours of gameplay. I was legitimately excited to hop on every day and continue my progression or if I only had a little bit of time to at least do some of my dailies, which are always helping me push my character into the next tier, which would unlock new fights, new dungeons, new gear, new content. But let's talk about some of the problems that you're going to run into past the first impression. I feel like Lost Ark is almost like the perfect bait and switch. And really, to be honest, a lot of mobile games employ this strategy really, really well. The first 75 to 100 hours are meant to be the hook. They're going to get you so mercilessly addicted to the gameplay loop and cycle of this game, and then they are slowly, ever so slowly, going to take away your dopamine. At a certain point, you're not going to be able to progress until you actually get to your next item level. And there's only a limited amount of activities per day, which will give you a limited amount of resources per day, which will only be a small amount of the resources that you actually need in total in order to progress. One of the main things that you can do to fix this is by attempting to make an alt and another alt, and another alt. And use those characters and also do dailies on them to slowly drip feed lower level resources into higher level resources, which could be used to benefit your main. And although this is just a first impressions video and we didn't really get into all of that, it would be bad for me to not warn you that when you get to the true end game of Lost Ark, you can have a lot of fun doing the raids and the content. And there's plenty of awesome activities that you can progress in, but in order to maintain being competitive, especially with some of the players who are putting a lot of money into the game, you're going to need to essentially play this game like it's a full-time job. Making sure that you are logging into your five other alternate characters every single day, where you do the same few activities over and over again in order to get enough resources to your main character. This becomes a sort of treadmill where you can't necessarily push yourself to go any faster unless you spend money there's a finite amount of progress that you can really make each day. All of that is to say, is Lost Ark worth playing in the year 2024? 
Well, like I said, I got at least 75 hours of some of the most entertaining and enjoyable gameplay that I've ever gotten out of an MMO, and I didn't pay a single dime. This game is free to play, and it is very easy to get sucked into paying money, but that doesn't mean you have to. There's very few other things in life that will give you 75 hours of enjoyment perfectly for free. But let me know, what do you guys think of Lost Ark? Is this monetization strategy justifiable in a free-to-play game with so much content? Or is it predatory and does it hurt the overall gaming market by normalizing these things? Thank you to everybody who made it to the end. Don't forget a like, a sub, those things help a bunch. And if you guys really enjoyed the video, please check out my Patreon. To further support me, there is a link down below. But I'll catch you guys in the next one. Later.